Hey guys, welcome to Japan Station, where I talk to interesting people who are in Japan or around the world and connected to Japan in some way. My name is Tony Vega. So just a heads up, this is the first ever video version of this show that I've ever released. There's actually over a hundred episodes that are just audio. <laughs> so you can look it up on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, you can go to japankyo.com, that's where I have all my stuff. Or you can just go in this YouTube channel, you can go in the older videos and it's all there. It's all just audio. But this is the first video version. And I'm talking to Jessica Garrity, who is, well, someone who's been on Japanese TV for a very long time. She tells us all about what that's like and the good and the bad and how it was learning Japanese and all that. It, it, it's a great conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, just a heads up though, there is a portion around the middle of the interview where my audio gets kind of distorted and kind of digitally. So I really apologize about that. Um, couldn't fix it, but <laughs> you know, if you just bear with that for like a couple of minutes, uh, it will go away. My guest's audio is totally normal. So just, just bear with that for a little bit and then my audio will go back to normal and, and we get into the rest of the conversation. So again, sorry about that, but I think you will enjoy this. Let's get into the episode. Welcome to Japan Station, a production of japanky.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. And for anybody watching on YouTube, we're doing video for the first time. So, hey, that's me. And you can already see my guest. <laughs> so for you audio people, sorry, but you can come over to YouTube if you want to check that out. But uh, today I have a really cool guest, uh, somebody with a really unique background who's doing some incredibly interesting stuff in Japan. So uh, <laughs> she works in the Japanese entertainment industry. She's on Japanese TV. If you live in Japan and watch TV, you may have even seen her before. Um, she's also a martial artist, does kudo. She also does yabusame, so on horseback, uh, archery, um, and, and a writer, and, and does a bunch of really cool stuff. So I'm, I'm really happy to have as my guest today, Jessica Garrity. Welcome. Yay! Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and thank you for being my first video guest. Like you're, you're used oh. to being on, on, on video, so <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Yeah, the camera is no problem. This is great. Congrats on your first video, yeah, video yeah, yeah. podcast. <laughs> Took a while, but I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting. I'm experimenting. But happy yeah. to have you here. Um, so, uh, as I said, like some, some people that watch Japanese TV may have even seen you already, may be familiar with your stuff. But um, can, can you tell us a little bit about like, um, you know, maybe some of the stuff that you've done, some of the shows that you've done, and, and where people may have seen your work? Sure. Uh, so... I've been on Japanese TV and in Japanese media for about maybe 16 years now. I've been in Japan 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, so a large part of the time, I've always had a full-time job uh, and I've always worked. However, being on Japanese TV is being kind of like that, that fun thing that I did. I joined a talent agency early on and I got a job on Japanese TV, which is actually the first job was SMAP Station with Katori wow. Shingo, so part of SMAP. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that was like really interesting because it was live and not much Japanese TV is live these days. Yeah. So it was kind of like your first foray into Japanese TV is live, so you, you can't kind of do anything weird because mm -hmm. uh, they can't edit it out. Yeah. So that part was kind of, a, it was like you just dive straight into the deep end kind of thing, but uh -huh. it's been really fun and um i've always had regular tv show which is nice um regular tv show is like the one that you're on every couple of weeks or every month or so they'll call you to come on it mm -hmm. uh and usually i'm the because i'm from new zealand usually i'm the new zealander that talks about new zealand and mm -hmm. um what things are like in new zealand so that's usually my uh, my job Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about New Zealand on Japanese TV. However, yeah, just at the moment, I'm on TBS, a TBS show called Sekai Kurabete Mitara, which is oh. comparing different countries in the world. So yeah. they have a thing and they'll compare. But yeah, it's super fun um, and difficult to make it full time work, I have to say. At mm -hmm. the moment, I, uh, I have three kids and I'm married and I have other jobs. And mm -hmm. this is a nice, like, cherry on the top. If mm -hmm. I can say that, it's like something else that's kind of out of the ordinary and interesting to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that Sekai Kurabete Mita, that show has been running for like 10 years, I think, right? Like it it, it started... Um, about, yeah. yeah, it's about six. And then before that, there was Sekai no Minna ni Kite Mita. So there's a different uh, version of it. Okay, and okay. then they rebranded it, changed it. It went to Golden. It used to be in the middle of the night. 
Gotcha. But even okay. then, yeah, even then it was super popular. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's become more and more like mainstream and more and more like generic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can't say anything, but yeah, um, I don't know how it's going to end, to be honest. Gotcha. However, um, yeah, but yeah, at the moment it seems to be doing okay. And mm. yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be on it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I re- I'm pretty sure I, I started watching that early when it when it first started broadcasting. I, I remember there's you know a panelists of people from around yeah. the world and they they showcase different kind of cultural things from you know many different countries. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and that that kind of content is quite popular on Japanese TV, right? Like yeah. kind of, uh, like a little bit of a travel and and cultural kind of you know mix of, of stuff. Um, very, yeah. very cool, very cool. And then SMAP, I mean, SMAP, like, wh- I mean, they're one of the biggest uh, idol, like, male <laughs> idol groups of the past, like, what, 30 yeah. years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, well, recently, you know, Donnie's has had a lot of yeah, stuff yeah. happening. However, you know, before that, before everything kind of came out, they released themselves from um, the contract and that kind of thing. So now they're all doing their own stuff. They all have social media now, which is really interesting as well. But yeah. just having that first foray into Japanese TV, being live and then with Katori Shingo and sometimes, you know, the other members would come on. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool to be like sitting next to them because you're mm-hmm. kind of like, wow. And yeah, I'm not, I have to admit, I'm not a huge J pop fan, but even I know SMAP, you know, like SMAP yeah, yeah. is pretty legendary. So yeah, it was really, really cool. And, um, a really nice kind of uh yeah it's been a really interesting interesting experience i have to say very right. positive for the most part but mm-hmm. yeah it's really given me an insight into sort of the the back of the entertainment industry in japan and what it's mm-hmm. really like which is which is also something we could talk about later definitely yeah yeah so um i, I do want to dig deeper into that but let's kind of mm-hmm. go back a bit and and I, i'd love to know how you got interested in japan and what what kind of motivated you to to go there and i know entertainment wasn't perhaps like at the forefront of your mind and it just kind of happened but yeah. what what got you to japan first so uh initially when i was very small uh, my father is a marine engineer and he's worked on ships all his life. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mother and my father, before they were married, you know, they went to Yokohama port. And I remember mm-hmm. my mother showing me at home in New Zealand, in Auckland, uh, tabi, which are, you know, the the socks that Japanese people wear with kimono. They only right. have two two spaces, one for your big, your big toe and the rest of the toes are like mm-hmm. separated. Mm-hmm. So she showed me these socks these are tabi and like i got these when i went to japan i was like japan where is japan you know this is before the internet I'm like, right, I right. Had no idea. yeah but i was like wow look at these socks they're like alien socks they're like crazy <laughs> i've never seen socks any you know like i think i was probably like five or six right um but yeah that was the first time i'd ever heard about this place called japan and then obviously in new zealand we have a lot of japanese cars and my father being an engineer loved his japanese cars and yeah yeah, so I would, I've would i grown up with having parts of Japan all around me in New Zealand as a child and not really connecting it to any place in particular. Same thing with dad, me. I remember. <laughs> yeah. You just got to absorb my... the stuff, right? And then later you realize like, oh, this is Japanese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've grown up with certain aspects of, of Japan that I never mm. sort of realized until later on. Right. Um, but the, the first time I went to Japan was actually in university and I made friends at university with uh, a woman who was father was Japanese and her mother was a New Zealander. Mm. And um, yes, yeah, she just invited me to come over to visit her family home, her jika in um, Himeji mm-hmm. and Hyogoken, so Kansai area. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, why not? Because I mean, young, you know, university student uh, and it's, it's like New Zealand summer vacation, uh, Japan, you know, Osho got to the end of the year. It's like oh. freezing cold, mm-hmm. opposite seasons. Wow, what would this be like? Like super adventurous. And of course, she's fluent in Japanese. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I have someone who speaks Japanese with me. It's like, it's a done deal. I was just like, yeah, that, that would be so awesome. So mm-hmm. I went and it blew my mind because I'd never been on a train before. Auckland's mm-hmm. train system isn't the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Shinkansen... I went in a keiji dosha, you know, the really small K yeah. cars, like Japanese mm-hmm. sized cars. It was just like, wow, this is like a toy. <laughs> um, yeah, everything kind of, I mean, at the time I was studying town planning, 
Yeah. Everything relating to the mixed use of the area, it's conveni- convenience store on the bottom of apartment buildings, right. which kind of blew my mind because in New Zealand, it's a little bit different. Uh, and yeah, the size of houses, the way the, the cities were laid out. And I was just like, wow, this is like such high density. And I mean, I was in Nagoya and um, Himeji, not so. And then I went eventually to Tokyo. But yeah, mm-hmm. just the whole the way the whole city was kind of blew my mind and I was Mm -hmm. like this is so cool and it really made a big impression on me and I ended up going back every year until I finished university so I graduated yeah I was uh handed in my thesis graduated my master's and I decided I wanted to work in Japan however Mm -hmm. the problem is that I couldn't speak Japanese so (laughs) I had a little look online you know what kind of jobs can non-Japanese you know native English speakers, non-Japanese speakers, what can they do? And, you know, being a woman and being from New Zealand, getting a job in Eikaiwa or, mm-hmm. you know, as a English language teacher is relatively straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so I just interviewed in Auckland for Nova and um, I got the job straight away and they organized my visa and a place to live and this kind of thing and it was all set. So I had everything organized before I went over there. Nice. And I was like, what? maybe 25, Mm -hmm. 24. Yeah. So I was young and I was like, okay, I have no plan, like no plan at all. I'll just work. The visa was for like a year. So I'll just work and see how I go. And yeah, I really loved it. I changed job within about three months, I think, because Nova, Mm. yeah, they're well known for being no vacation. So (laughs) (laughs) And eventually no No, salary. (laughs) No, no, but but, but means vacation, right? So it's like, usually you get days off uh, separate. And um, during the week, so you yeah. don't really get to hang out with any friends you make, or it's kind of uh, it's not great for lifestyle balance. Really, yeah, working yeah. at the time, it wasn't anyway. So started teaching kids, um, working for an international preschool, and that was great. That really helped my Japanese. So I came with no Japanese language, and yeah, I just taught myself basically. Wow. So that was kind of sorry. I went way off something, no. but um, that was that was how I kind of had my first little taste of Japan and then how I ended up over there. Nice. So uh, I guess, did did you study a bit of Japanese before you went? And then once you were there and, and interacting with people, then that really pushed you to, to actually be able to start having uh, conversations no, and stuff? No, no study. No, no study. study. Oh, okay. Nah, I was, I mean, I had aisatsu, so I could say, you know, like, uh, good morning and, yeah. you know, konnichiwa, ohayou gozaimasu. That's mm. pretty much it. But I mean, that's all you need, really. Yeah, yeah. Huh. <laughs> and then did, did you largely then pick it up through interactions and conversations with, with people? Yeah. Yeah. So I wow. realized I am, I mean, people have different learning styles. There yeah, are people yeah. that learn by reading and this kind of thing. And I realized after watching Japanese TV for a couple of months that mm-hmm. I remembered everything I heard. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm definitely like an audio learner. I remember everything. So it was cool. And, you know, you get, perfect sentence structure like yes. patterns on tv so i could just like repeat them like a parrot like back to people and i would um yeah i would get nice reactions and then i learned a lot of um men's japanese on purpose just to <laughs> kind of like make just to make people smile yeah, uh, yeah i remember yeah i remember doing that and also yeah just it it kind of um it builds on top of each other so you just remember a little bit at a time and at first i remembered adjectives because they were so helpful in explaining the way i felt or you can ask people how you feel or what you think so for me adjectives learning adjectives i'm hot cold uh, it's too fast too slow Mm -hmm. um i'm good i'm not good you know it's an easy way to communicate your feelings which i found really great for connecting with people yeah 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 and and i i love what you mentioned now about just like through tv and and in a sense like memorizing and repeating because like i i did the same thing in in a certain phase i i studied a lot you know via books but then i got to a certain point where i started just watching stuff and actually like writing stuff what yeah. what they were saying and then using that like the same sentence structure the same way that i would see in an anime or in a tv show or in a movie and i think that really helped my japanese sound more natural because i wasn't translating i was kind of listening and copying what was considered natural in yeah. in in the japanese language so yeah. I, that's yeah, a great definitely. approach 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, so then, what? At what point did did the you know TV entertainment thing come around? Did somebody say like, "Hey, you should do this," or did you have that idea, or like, what? What? How did that come about? Yeah. So a person online who I had met, I think like international friend exchange kind of thing online. Mm-hmm. So before social media, they said, you know, like. I, I mean, the thing was in Japan at the time. If you are a non-Japanese person, uh, it's quite straightforward and easy to be a model, what they call a model or a tarento, mm-hmm. which is just someone who's on TV. So you don't yeah. have to have any specific, you know, things in particular, except that you are not Japanese. Yeah. So uh, it's slightly different to other countries, perhaps. However, yeah, the person just said, "Hey, you know, I mean, you're from New Zealand, and New Zealand is a kind of." There's not that many on TV or in different media. How about you go to a, a talent agency and like register? Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, that's awesome. Except I have no idea. You know, there's no not that many websites about it or how to get into it or there was absolutely no information. They right. took me over to this quite famous one that is really well known for just having non-Japanese people only on their books and they mm-hmm. just do TV as their main thing. So, I, I mean, straight out of the out of the gate, I got this really amazing connection to this very, very big talent agency and I mm. just joined. Wow. And within kind of a month or so, they put me in an audition for this TV show, which I eventually got. So it was just like, I kind of just went with the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was, yeah, about 16 or more, maybe 16 years ago. So... It's just been kind of a thing that I've yeah. done from there. However, at the time, you know, I couldn't speak really very well at all to be mm-hmm. on a, a TV show where you have to talk and explain about something like New Zealand. Mm-hmm. So for the first little while, I was like the person in the audience, uh, not in the audience, in the studio together with the, the Japanese talent. Though, mm-hmm. And they, um, how can I explain, like reacting. Right. And, saying some small things, but not doing big, like, explanations about New Zealand or anything like that. Mm -hmm. However, over time, my Japanese got better, and, um, yeah, I started to get more talking parts in the the, the daihon, in the script for the Mm TV. Everything is scripted, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so it just kind of went from there, and, yeah, it's been really fun. Wow, wow. So so then your your advice is get on TV, it will improve your Japanese. (laughs) Basically, yeah. I mean, like that's seriously, like yeah. that's one way. That <laughs> but that's really pressure, like, right? Like that. I mean, sometimes yeah. you need that, like push, to get you to that next level. Because we all kind of plateau at certain points, and then if you have that kind of push to get you over that plateau, that certainly does help. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a necessity, right? It's like yeah. survival Japanese. You lose yeah. your job otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. That's that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you're 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 getting that sense of satisfaction, and you know, in a way, I mean, I I don't know, you know, if the pay makes it all worthwhile, but you're kind of getting paid to improve your Japanese, so it's it's you know, that's a nice little bonus. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's true. The pay is not great, but yeah. but yeah, it's better than nothing, right? You're right. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so then, um, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that, and then you, so how, uh, d- does it, I guess this map job goes well, and you start to get other opportunities, and, and you know, it, it just becomes like a, a steady, you know, more or less a steady thing from, from there on? Yeah, so shows in Japan, they they have different seasons, and if they don't get extended to the next season, then they finish. Hmm. So... There are other opportunities to be in other TV shows. They came along and they were mm-hmm. looking for New Zealanders or the the standard kind of thing is like you said, they have a panel of different people from different countries explaining about, yeah, as they're asked to explain about their country and this kind of thing. So mm-hmm. usually on, especially TBS has a lot of these kind of TV shows, but um, yeah, just one after the other. So one TV show would sort of end naturally after three or four years I would be on sort of the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, um, and then you said the the standard is there's a script and they, they give it to you. Like, how, how does that work? Like, do you show up and they give it to you? Do you get it ahead of time? Like, what? how do you do that? 
Um, so we get sent a questionnaire yeah. from the the TV show, and they will have certain questions on there pertaining to their next theme that they're going to do a recording on. Mm-hmm. And um, we answer the questionnaire with, you know, how is New Zealand like this certain theme? Like, what is New Zealand food like for Christmas? So what are you doing for Christmas? Like, what games do you play? Do you spend time with your family? Like, what season is it? This kind of thing. So we answer all these different things. And uh, if you can make the question as interesting and as sort of like new information and things they haven't heard before, they will put it into the script. They reword it for you and put it in the script. And this is what you'll say when it's, you know, you're called on um, for a Japanese TV. So, Yeah. Well, you you is, is take like several a, hours um, for the um, for the research for that for the questionnaire usually. Right, right, right. So you, yeah, you have to provide the basis, and then they they'll prepare something for you. Um, so there's you're I mean you're you're doing the prep work in a sense, right? <laughs> they kind of clean yeah. it up. Yeah. But yes. it, is there like a teleprompter or something like on on the, the stage, or do you have to memorize no, everything? No, so. Usually we get the script on the day, the Mm -hmm. morning, and you have a couple of hours and then you need to remember it and to Mm -hmm. be able to say it properly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, okay. And you need to say it from memory, yeah. Wow, okay. Um, And and here's here's a little bit of a random question, but like I, and I haven't been watching too much Japanese TV lately, so I'm not sure if this is starting to change, but for a very long time, even like uh, up until, you know, the past few years ago when I, when I was still watching more Japanese TV, like they would use the piddle. No, no, the tin up is the thing on the TV. The, the what's that? Fripu, fripu, right? So that's the board, right? It, they, they'll bring out, like, the, on, on these information type shows, they'll bring out a literal board and they'll, like, unveil information instead of, like, usually in Western American TV, they'll use, like, a digital something, right? Like, yeah. or something. So, but in Japanese TV, they love it? using the physical like, thing, right? Yeah. So for some <laughs> reason in Japan, it's all handwritten and they call it kampe. Oh, okay. okay, I didn't know that. Kampe word. is cunning paper, which means like um, <laughs> it's just the notes of what they want you to say. It's bullet points. It's yeah. not like the exact word for word. Yeah. So um, yeah, they call it kampe, and uh-huh. I don't get given kampe. Uh, one reason is that I probably couldn't read it. Yeah. I mean, I my eyes are not the best, but yeah. um, usually I just remember it. It's a lot. It's a lot easier. Some people write it on their hand. It's really funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I I feel like it's more natural if I'm not reading it off right. off camera somewhere, and you know, my eyes are wandering around. Absolutely. The words that I need to say, but yeah, yeah usually there's kampe and it's quite like pared down of the the details. So if you haven't read the daihon and tried to remember it. <laughs> the script you're gonna be like kind of you know intro so yeah no sorry there was a little digital problem there (laughs) but i I was just saying that i I love these uh very specific like slang words that you get in the you know tv and entertainment industry in in japan so one i didn't know that word thank you for teaching me that (laughs) Uh, all right so um just i I do want to get into you know your martial arts stuff and all that but just one little area that i want to ask you about so um could you tell me like s- maybe like a, a favorite aspect of you you working you know in in the tv industry and then maybe something that you know g- maybe something negative or kind of like a, the, the downside you know everything has a positive and negative so i don't know could you tell us something that you absolutely love and then something that can be really tricky to manage Sure. So one thing that i really like about mm-hmm. working in the tv industry here in japan mm-hmm. is uh, especially those kind of shows where you have many people from many different countries. Mm-hmm. I don't have this huge group of friends uh, from different countries in the world here in Japan. A lot of my friends are all just Japanese people. Mm-hmm. So it's really nice uh, and interesting a lot of the times mm-hmm. uh, to meet all these other, I mean, really rare countries, like like I'm collecting them or something. Yeah. Really <laughs> rare countries, like from the Bahamas or yeah. from... Yeah, like from like Trinidad and Tobago or like yeah. from like, I know I meet these people and everyone's fluent in Japanese. So we're all here looking like this collection from around the world of different faces and we're all speaking fluent Japanese. Uh-huh. Um, it's really weird, but it's fun. It's really nice to get to know other people in this really highly concentrated, like everyone's preparing for the TV show in mm-hmm. this, um, in the room that you're in. 
the changing room, the waiting room. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to meet uh, people from other countries mm -hmm. like this and everyone's doing the same kind of job as you and they have the same interest of, you know, being on TV and talking about their country. So super right. passionate people. And um, yeah, it's just, it's like this really intense networking session. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, where I would never kind of like think about going to an like a, I don't know international friend party or something like that sure kind of like getting paid to you know meet people before the camera starts rolling which mm -hmm. is one aspect that I really like so I'm quite I'm like introverted social kind mm -hmm. of a person so it's nice to be stuck with people who are working as well however the type of people that I would never usually come into contact with sure so, sure sure yeah so that's one really really positive aspect is mm -hmm. the kind of you know, broadens my worldview at the same time. I get to talk to a lot of people at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then negative, uh, I don't know, like not for me, myself personally. However, things like the buraku kinkyo, so the mm. quite like we could say um, work, work and health related um, industry that yeah. regulates um, different you know, work environments and uh, industries in Japan, mm -hmm, and some mm -hmm. of them are quite non-existent, like mm -hmm. penalties for overwork and this kind of thing. As I'm sure people know, a lot of uh, international media have reported on kaloshi, which is death due to overwork. Mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. a bit of a dark topic. So maybe um, kind of a warning here. However, mm -hmm. um, it's just interesting to see how hard everybody works in the entertainment and um, television industry. So yeah. the Japanese people who are AD, so assistant directors, and the mm -hmm. D, which is the director, the P, which is the producer, and the <laughs> yeah. EP, which is the executive producer. Everybody looks like they haven't slept for two weeks. Uh, yeah. And no joke, until the the day of the filming, and they've filmed it, they probably go home, take a shower, sleep, and then come back and start editing it because it will yeah. go up like that week onto TV. So just the people that edit, the work behind the scenes of the TV industry, I have big respect for them because uh, I believe that they're passionate about their job and then they want to be in the industry um, for the most part. Uh, and yeah, just I really feel for them because yeah, we yeah. Uh, as Tanito come in, we'll do our job. We do, yes, we do the questionnaire and it takes a couple of hours and then we, we do need to learn and there is a certain amount of stress that goes into what we do. So if, mm -hmm. it, if it feel a bit stressed out, maybe nervous. Mm -hmm. However, theirs is sort of really intense um, work and no no days off as far as I can see for certain people. Yeah. Um, yeah, until the show ends like five years later. They're just like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, that that the, the Uda, can we say? The, yeah. the back the back of the uh, TV industry is very, very, not yeah. everything, not all of them, but some shows, especially the shows that are on prime time, we can mm. call it Gordon, Gordon time. Yeah. So yeah, around 7.30 until 10 at night, they're very high stress, high demand um, types of shows for the people working in the background. So that's one negative thing was just like it really brought um, sort of reality check to me of how hard um, the people work to get the shows onto TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, this is a, a common thing, not just in in the television industry in Japan, but you know, I've I've heard also pay even for those individuals is is often not particularly good. You know, a yeah, ads right. especially, I would I would assume because they're the assistants, they're not even like the yeah. main people, but they're yeah. they're they're doing a little bit of everything. They're they're kind of you know they're the ones mm -hmm. helping in every single aspect. So yeah. it, it it can be very 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 tough to to get these. I mean these these are weekly shows. You know most oftentimes like the kinds of shows that, that you're on every single you know Monday or Tuesday or whatever. There's a new show coming out and there's a lot of prep work that goes in behind the scenes. And even like the the hosts I've I've heard you know I, I'm sure the hosts that are like the famous people you know they, of course they're probably getting paid more, but still like the really popular people sometimes they're doing what like five six seven eight shows a week or something, and it's like. That that's all they're doing, and and even for them, it it can be quite tough. Like, I mean, they get more money, but still, it it's not it's not easy necessarily. Yeah, like real. I was thinking, you know, like I said, this is kind of it's not a full time thing for me. But imagine mm -hmm. being 
when you you get your we can call it break yeah. you become suddenly super famous overnight and every tv show wants you every yeah. radio show wants you so yeah. radio is still really big here in japan yes it is yeah um so you're just going from morning until night, basically, um, going to different TV shows, doing your guest spot. And maybe you have an MC job for your certain regular TV show. You're on mm -hmm. radio until midnight, 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next morning you do a morning. Yeah, it's just like, and that's for maybe, if you're lucky, five, six, seven years straight. Yep. Um, it's like, how do you guys not burn out? Like, honestly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they have yeah. to kind of make hay while, while the sun shines, if you know what I mean. Because I, yeah, the, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everywhere in the world, though, the industry is quite fickle. And yeah. yeah, as soon as you kind of hit your use by date, you're like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's the ones that are able to carve out some kind of sustainable niche, you know, they'll, they'll stick around even yeah. if they're not at their peak. But oftentimes, yeah, they, you know, there will be people that last sometimes even less than a year and then they kind of disappear. Yeah sometimes a few years and then they disappear you know it, it, it's yes. a, it can be a very tough industry um yeah. i mean you know us as well but japan has its own yeah. you know nuances yeah um so okay so then let, let's get into so first of all you know q though of course japanese archery and and you 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 i heard that you got started in this you're you're if you if People look at your social media, you, they'll see your videos and stuff. There's a lot of Kudo content and your YouTube as well. I was watching a couple of your videos. You talk about, you know, the the differences between like archery and like Western kind of archery yeah. and then Japanese archery. I saw that video. Yeah. Um, so actually, it, there's a little bit of a connection between your TV work or your media work, I think, right? And your and how you got started in into Kudo? Um, not you, you were interviewing somebody or something like that. I, I think I heard in in another interview that you did. I I saw a practice by chance with my family mm -hmm. when I was going to the park, and that was basically oh, the start. Okay. But um, that was the first time I saw it. But yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. So I um, not the first time I saw it, but I got a connection to mm -hmm. start at the beginners class during mm -hmm. a radio show. So oh, okay. That was that was just like a lot of people. I mean, 75% of the Kudo population are middle school, high school, and university mm. students. Like, it's mostly young people mm -hmm. that do Kudo. And um, because it's Bukatsu, which is, you know, club activities for Japanese students. And mm -hmm. um, this guy who is the radio show personality, he used to do it in high school or university i think and he was mm -hmm. like yeah i have friends and i'll call them and one of them's in saitama too so i'm from Sait i'm living and not from saitama i'm living in saitama <laughs> and um yeah so he was like maybe you can join their you know their beginners class you have to join the beginners class to be able to start at a dojo yeah and the, the problem with the beginners classes is only once a year and if you miss the cutoff you have to wait a year and um they only accept 10 or 15 or 20 people at a time and it's like hundreds of people applying for these 10 spots or 15 spots yeah so uh, i hadn't really had much luck searching up on information so he's like oh i'll introduce you and he introduced me to a guy who yeah he's kind of um he takes all the photos on my social media actually mm. um and yeah that was like the the start for me to actually put my foot inside the dojo but yeah the first time i saw it it was a while back and it was in saitama and i was kind of like wow i mean i knew archery yeah uh reserve i knew i knew it i hadn't really done it that much a couple mm -hmm. of times um and i was like wow these bows they're like really really extra they're super long mm -hmm. everybody's moving really slowly this is really different to any kind of archery i've ever seen before mm -hmm. so i was like super enthralled i watched the practice for a while um i was there for hanami actually in this park mm -hmm. so i had to go eventually but yeah it really kind of like set the wheels of my mind in motion i was like i really want to do this this is like something that looks so interesting and cool and super calming to watch mm -hmm. but yeah yeah so i kind of had a period between seeing it and actually starting yeah that was um it was a really it was like 10 years later i it mm -hmm. ended up starting which is good yeah right right so um, like I, I've, I've, I've seen it. I'm familiar with it. I've never done it. I I've done some martial arts like Aikido and stuff, but I've never done, um, Kudo. So what, yeah. what is the, um, like, is it, is it expensive to get started? Like, what does a bow cost? Like, what do you have to buy arrows? Can you reuse arrows? Like what's the kind of, can you tell us a little bit of like the practical thing yeah. for anybody that's curious? 
Sure. So I did a post on the costs of keto on Instagram because mm-hmm. I get a lot of questions. But for me, mm-hmm. it's um, the cost of the beginner's class varies dojo to dojo. But mm-hmm. um, it's usually a couple of nights a week for a month that you do this this course. And mm-hmm. it's between like $10 US and like $30 US to wow. have somebody teach you. And you're together with a whole lot of other beginners. Mm-hmm. And um, they lend you equipment. So you don't need to mm-hmm. buy anything. Mm-hmm. So that's that. And then if you decide you want to continue, uh, depending on the dojo again in Japan, a uh, mine is 100 yen, so about a dollar to get in. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. And I mean, my teacher is just there. So if he's there and I'm there, he'll just teach me or he'll be mm-hmm. at the moment, you know, like it's. I've been doing it about five and a half years, getting on six years. So mm-hmm. he'll just give me pointers here and there. Mm-hmm. It's not like Aikido or Kendo or Naginata in my mm-hmm. experience where you start at a certain time and you all sit down and you all do warm up, you all do mokso, you all do practice, and then everybody finishes at the same time. Mm. It's, it's like you come and go as you please. Right. So that part of it really sort of fits with my lifestyle. Anyway, mm. um, in terms of the cost, I borrowed a bow. I bought my own glove, which is um, made of, which is made of deer skin. So. Mm. Different parts of kudo are really like traditional crafts. How mm-hmm. can we say? Bento kogehin. Right. So it's, um, we we don't use like a thumb ring or a nantinake. I can't remember the name of it. But yeah, for <laughs> archery, a tab. We don't use a tab. We just gotcha. use a hardened, yeah, hardened thumb. Here it's got wood inside it. But these mm-hmm. are made of um, deer skin. So mm. two or three hundred dollars sort of as a starting price. If you have this. Yeah. They lend you the other stuff, like arrows and bow and stuff, until you can oh. buy your own. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't start off expensive, or it didn't for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I mean, yeah, like, uh, just if you can, once you get started, it's only, you know, a, a couple hundred, whatever, you know, a hundred yeah. hundred yen or so if, at, at your specific place. Maybe it varies from place to place, but it yeah. seems like it's fairly inexpensive to, like, continue yes. over the long term. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or well, not even fairly, like very, <laughs> like yeah, hundred yen. I mean, it depends on what yeah. kind of equipment you want to use. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, definitely, bamboo is obviously more expensive because it's yeah. handmade. Sure. But um, I just use like cheap arrows and a reasonably cheap bow. It doesn't yeah. have to be um, really amazing. That's just the way my teacher thinks, though. He just yeah, you yeah. know until you can do it properly, don't bother spending money to get a bamboo bow because you're just gonna break it. Yeah, 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 and and of course, I mean, outside of Japan, I'm sure it totally varies, totally different. But you know, if if you're in Japan, it, it's probably more affordable <laughs> overall. Yeah, definitely in yeah. Japan, yeah. I think yeah. country to country, it probably yeah. varies a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then what? One more aspect of of this that that I was I saw you you also do like on, on horseback. You've been doing that lately. It seems like so yeah. archery on horseback. You have some like how, how did that happen? I mean, that's that seems like a little more tricky to get into than just you know normal. No, it's, <laughs> you know? it's really it's really easy. Um, uh-huh. So yabusame is the traditional form of horseback archery. I do sports yeah. yabusame, so it's a different category of uh-huh. yabusame um however just to kind of give a little rundown i started Mm -hmm. during covid when the dojos were shut and this is outdoors so there wasn't any worry about uh catching anything or Mm -hmm. so i don't i don't i don't always wanted to try like i can ride a horse obviously japanese horses and horse uh equestrianism in japan is very very different to western or British styles of horse riding. Let me just put it that way. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, I've grown up riding horses. So, oh, okay. And, that helps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I'm not an expert or anything like okay. that. However, I never took lessons or anything like that. I just gotcha. go every year and, um, and they're not, uh, really, like, not never touched one or anything like that. So I had uh, some experience. Okay. And, um, yeah, COVID gave me the chance to mm-hmm. try. And I found a place, Sports Yabusame. You can go and they'll let you do it on the first day. Like, wow. I mean, yeah. And it's the same bow as Kudo. It's the same arrows as Kudo. Oh, awesome. So I just took my equipment. They don't use a glove, though. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just took my equipment. And it was nice. It was really, really nice. You start off walking. They teach you all you need to know. 
and um, anybody can do it. If you're coming to Japan, just hit me up on Instagram and I'll tell you where it is. Oh, that's so there cool. are a couple of different places. Yeah, I mean, and you don't have to have Japanese. There are some mm-hmm. that do a full instruction in English. Aomori, a place called Towada is very famous. There are mm-hmm. Sakura Yabusame, all woman Yabusame. They will um, they will teach you in English. They have a three day course, so you'll you'll learn um, wow. how to. Yeah, you'll learn how to do everything in three days. So it's quite intense, but yeah, yeah, in English, which I think is really cool. So the one that is tricky and difficult to get into is um, Yabusame Shinji, which is a Shinto ritual. Mm-hmm. And the one that's a Shinto ritual, you join a certain yuha or koryu, so the mm-hmm. t- certain type of um, Yabusame. So the main two are Ogasawara Ryu and Takeda Ryu. Mm-hmm. So these different schools of archery and horsemanship so you learn um to ride washiki bajutsu which is japanese horse riding style japanese mm. saddle japanese stirrups mm-hmm. uh japanese bridle japanese horse tag is very very different to uh western or british styles so wow. the way you control the horse and the way you ride the horse is a lot different mm-hmm. um so you, once you've learned you know your riding skills and you kind of well, it's a shugyo, so you're training, and mm-hmm. it's a training period until you get to debut and be uh, an archer. So mm. it takes years, <clears throat> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, depending on the school and how how good your riding skills are and how good your you know your skills with the bow and the arrow are. But um, yeah, it's it's just a little bit of a longer period. I haven't heard of. Uh, Yabusame school, a traditional Yab- Yabusame school available in English. As far as mm-hmm. I know, I think you'd need to speak Japanese. Right. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, the reasons that people do it are probably different to the reasons that I do it. Mm-hmm. So the reasons that people probably do traditional Yabusame is they want to preserve, you know, traditional Japanese culture mm-hmm. going forward and, um, you know, be a part, a living part of Japanese culture, which I think is really nice. So these Shinto ceremonies are wishes for, you know, a bit of harvest, for world peace, this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So going back to the type that I do, which is sports, Yabusame. So it's got that word in there, sports. So it's mm-hmm. kyogi, which is um, a competitive event. So it's like horseback archery, just mm-hmm. you got to hit the target and you need to, you know, hit closest to the middle if possible to get the points. And the thing is, that's kind of a, a crossover area, is that I learned the traditional style of riding with traditional Japanese horses, so mm-hmm. indigenous Japanese horses and traditional bagu, which is horse sack. So we mm-hmm. do have the same saddles, the same, uh, all the different pieces are uh, pretty much the same. The riding style is the same. The difference is that me and you can do it. Mm. Um, on the first day so mm-hmm. there's a lot less um, difficulty to start mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah that's very cool has i i can I'm, I'm just thinking you know japanese tv seems like they would love to do a story about you doing this has that happened yet <laughs> um it's very difficult to set up like uh <laughs> logistically yeah gotcha. it's, it's in yamanashi the place i go to is about three or four hours away yeah, yeah. so yeah logistically and like, how can I say it's um, expensive, <laughs> probably uh, for the Japanese TV show. Gotcha. And I live here already. Like they've done shows actually on people who have come from overseas to come and learn traditional right. Yabusame, a French they do like that. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of thing. I think Japanese people want to see. But someone gotcha. who's lived here forever and is, who is just not as interesting, like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not not that interesting. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So gotcha. the reasons that I um I post about it on social media are just yeah. because it's a very accessible thing that people can do when they come and visit Japan. So yeah. there is this image of it's so hard to get into, like, and it's so difficult. Like to be honest, um, like I think if you had a couple of sessions, you'd be able to do it just fine. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it sounds um, like a super unique thing, and and apparently it's it's a lot easier than most people to to do to get started, right? Than most yeah, people but, think. I mean, every country has their, I mean, their archery culture and their horseback archery culture. You know, Mongolia. Mm-hmm. I mean, all different countries around the world have that, yeah. and so it's something that kind of connects us, you know, all around the world. So if you had horseback archery experience too, you'd probably be able to do it straight away. 
Awesome. Okay. So, um, all right. So of course you're on Instagram, you're on YouTube. You you also do a lot of writing um, about, you know, the, this martial arts and Kudo that yeah. and you, you, I know you've, you've interviewed a lot of people before. I don't know. Is there like anything specific you want to tell people like, Oh, come check out my work here or there. Or, I, I don't know. Like w- what's the best place to find you? Yeah. So I usually post everything up on Instagram and Twitter. Okay. Uh, and what is it at the moment? Threads has just started. Threads it's has nice. just started. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can click links, so yeah. that's good. But um, I mean, I have a link tree which has all my um, social media information, which I'll send through to you later on. Gotcha. But um, the writing that I do is uh-huh. some of it is in Japanese and some is in English. Oh, okay. The Japanese, yeah, the Japanese writing that I do is for a journal called Kudo Nippon. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm on the board of editors for this particular quarterly magazine. And it's just all about Kudo. Mm -hmm. So I write an article series that I just made up myself. I just Mm -hmm. decided, like, wouldn't it be cool to interview different Kudo practitioners from around the world Mm -hmm. and find out, like, why they started? And -hmm. and the articles are in Japanese Mm -hmm. so that Japanese Kudo, other Japanese Kudo practitioners or Japanese readers can... um, see you know like why all these different non-japanese people are doing it their motivations are really interesting i think and Mm -hmm. um, to show other practitioners how the positive aspects and what other people think of kudo so i just wanted to kind of give it a non-japanese flavor in there in the magazine Mm -hmm. even though everything's in japanese and so that's like one article series that i do and the other is for uh budojapan.com so mm-hmm. budojapan.com is in English and it is the English the English site for the Japanese martial arts magazine called Gekkan Hiden which is a monthly Japanese martial arts magazine like mm-hmm. black belt like black belt but it's mm-hmm. the Japanese version gotcha. um yeah so they have an English site and um all my articles there are on different aspects of martial arts and they're all in English and they're all online and they're all free so nice. I will post on my stories or I'll post um, on my on my Instagram, on my Twitter, everything. I'll post the links to the different articles. Recently, I interviewed a traditional Yabusame archer, a guy who is Australian and mm-hmm. super, super amazing. Um, and I went to go watch him ride, actually, in Nikko. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was the first time for me to ever see traditional Yabusame, like Yabusame Shinji. So mm-hmm. that was just like, it blew my mind and it was really cool. It was nice to meet him. So we had an interview. So there's an interview article up there uh, nice. on the internet. And the other one that I do is I am a Saitama Prefectures. Uh, how can I say? Like tourism and PR ambassador. So right. I have this job. I have this, I have this official title working for the Japanese prefectural government so nice. i have this uh, thing that i put on here yeah um and i am a love love saitama ambassador so i go <laughs> to different yeah I, it, it's really cool because i live in saitama so this yeah, is perfect that's awesome i go to um different places and interesting thing go to interesting things and visit different places and write about it in english so they have uh, a travel magazine that uh-huh. I will post articles to. And I nice. posted one. Actually, I made a post this morning. Oh. So I went to visit Tatami and I uh-huh. made made my own little like Tatami. And I, I didn't really know much about Tatami in depth, but this yeah. is kind of I went to go visit the craftsperson, the artisan who makes the Tatami. Cool. It smells so good. Yeah. So I go and this is in Saitama. He's in a different part of Saitama. So uh-huh. I went to visit him and make a little article. You can go and make tatami together with him. So just to help, um, you know, give a little, some eyes on his business and that kind of thing as well. And I did a post on him too. And Very yeah, cool. that's the other thing that I do. So lots of different, yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> You're very busy. So what what is the um handle for Instagram? Um I, I don't know if it's the yes. same on Twitter. Yes. So Twitter and TikTok and Instagram is all the same and also YouTube as well. It's uh-huh. Jess in Tokyo in one word, which is J E S S I N T O K Y O. 
Gotcha. Okay. So check that out. Link, of course, in the show notes, like always. So if you want to check out more of uh, Jessica's work, it's all going to be there. And there's tons and tons of stuff. (laughs) So so thank you so much for making time and your busy schedule to talk to me. It's wonderful to learn about, you know, all the stuff that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome to have a chat. Yeah.